Okay, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with uh, Zach. And how to pronounce your last name? Buscape. Buscape. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, for people, you know, if there's people listening to this that don't know you, maybe you could kind of introduce yourself and kind of talk a little bit about yourself. Okay. So my name is Zach Buscape. I live in Japan, between France and Japan. I work mostly as a translator for major Japanese promotion, like... Uh, Rising, Deep, Shuto, Pancreas, and also helping fighters who fight in those promotions by helping them in their weight cut, the camp, whatever they need in Japan, and uh, I'm there to, to assist them mostly. And also now I just signed with uh, Deep, a, a major Japanese promotion, and I just fought uh, on the November 1st. It didn't go my way, but uh, I have uh, another chance in March or April. Now, how did, when, let's talk about when you first went to Japan, like when was your first exposure to it? Uh, my first exposure with MMA is back in 2003 with the, the Pride event at the Tokyo Dome where you had uh, uh, Overeem fighting Chuck Liddell in the Pride Grand Prix. That's why I get really to see it, not only in Japan, but uh, my first MMA event ever. That's the first contact I had with MMA. And after seeing that event, I decided that that's what I want to do. I want to train in MMA and uh, start coming in Japan and train uh, in the Shooter Box Academy. That's the first thing, uh, the first gym I went to. It's um, the Vandele Silva gym in Japan. Now it's no more, but uh, that's the first gym I went to. And uh, what were you doing in Japan at that time when you first saw it? Oh, you mean uh, what uh, I was uh, working? What was I was doing there? Yes, I was. I was uh, working as um, as security manager uh, for clubbing and uh, cl cigar clubs. So I was doing mostly in securities job, and then from there, I went to translating for uh, MMA. And how did you end up? Who contacted you about translating? How'd that work out? I mean, how'd you get that job? Uh, I was um, training with a, a friend that was working for a Japanese newspaper. And he said, like, yeah, I see that you, you're a foreigner and you understand English and Portuguese as well. So why don't you translate for MMA? I can introduce you. And uh, my first MMA translation was with Pancras, which is on UFC Fight Pass. And I start translating mostly in Portuguese for fighters who come from Brazil. And from there, I, I was translating in Shuto, uh, Rising, uh, Deep, uh, mostly all MMA promotion in Japan. So they all kind of took you on together? like? Yes, it went by step by step. Like I was in Pancreas and then inside Pancreas, people introduced me to other promotion. And then like, for example, I started in Pancreas. And inside Pancrase, I met people that were working with Shuto. So I moved to Shuto and then I went from Shuto to uh, Rising and on and on. So how many fighters do you think just kind of roughly that you're working with? Wow, that's a number I work uh, since 2000, since I started this job in 2006, I should have worked with maybe 30 to 40 fighters at least. Like yeah, 2006 was right as I was leaving. I actually left in 2005. I was there for three years. Oh. 2002 to 2005. Oh, so yeah. you, you stayed there in Tokyo too? No, I, I was in the military. So I lived kind of, oh. I lived in a small Japanese town called Uraga. Uraga. Nice. Yeah, which is in the Yokosuka area, I guess. Yeah. Oh, so you live in the, in the U.S. base? No, no, I lived in a Japanese neighborhood, like in a house. In a house, oh. Yeah, the cool. military paid for it, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I liked living. It was a nice community, you know, like I was the only foreigner in the neighborhood, oh. you know. Because, yeah, that's, that's cool, because you went in a time uh, where there's not many foreigners. Now, you know, Japan is more open to foreigners and try to bring more foreign fighters in Japan. But before, in this time, 2002, 2003, around the two, early 2000s, there were not many foreigners. So you went in a time where things were different, but 
also more exciting. Like you, the only one foreigner, you discovering stuff. That's a pretty cool time to be in Japan, I think. So let's kind of talk about like your first, you go to Pride to Tokyo Dome. I was at that event. Maybe talk about your remembrance of it. Uh, the energy, the energy, the energy was awesome. The audience and you have Lin Hart screaming, the fire is coming because I was watching before that, I was watching the old Valley Tudor stuff with bare hands, uh, bare knuckle fighting, NHB, all that. But, you know, they didn't have that kind of opening production, the videos before the fights, the lights, the, all that stuff. We never, I never seen that before. But seeing that was crazy. It's, I was like, not just watching a fight, I was watching a show. And that, that, that's the, the number one thing I remember. That's really got me in. That's the, the atmosphere, the energy. You see, there's 80,000 people in the, in the arena watching a small ring in the middle, two guys fighting. And uh, all that light, all that stuff, that was, that was it. I was hooked. I was hooked. That's it. <laughs> right. And I think for Pride, especially that event was probably one of the best ones they've ever done. Oh, for sure. You know, all the fights are really good. And uh, so that was a good one for you to see the first time. Yes. Uh, I, was, I, I really enjoyed the fight uh, with um, uh, Overeem and uh, Chuck Liddell. Mm -hmm. Because at the first, uh, Overeem was doing good. He was doing good. And then uh, uh, Chuck Liddell also. So he could have gone both ways. It was a great fight. And uh, Vandele and Rampage, also the classical. That was some great stuff. Yeah, Overeem was really taking it to Liddell. And then Liddell kind of threw the kind of like over. The overhand. Yeah, almost like a baseball, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Way back from yeah. there, like he was throwing a ball at him. Yeah. That was yeah. crazy stuff. And it just turned the fight that fast. Yes. And um, so many stuff happened in Pride, you know, so many stuff to remember, like the slam from Arona to um, to what was his name? Uh, Rampage, when the Rampage slam Arona. That was a classic moment, so much classic moment. The knees from Vandelays to to Rampage in the in the second fight, where Rampage fall on the on the ropes, that was crazy. And uh, when uh, Randleman may he rest in peace knocked out uh, uh, Mikko Krokop, so many stuff you know back then happened like you will never know who's gonna win. Everything could happen in the in the ring, like on the paper. You see, okay, this guy is higher than the other guy, but when they're both inside the ring, it's truly where everything can happen in that era. That's the thing that made Pride uh, the, the, its name, I think. So when you start translating, like, who were some of the first fighters you're working with? So the first fighter I was working with was a Brazilian guy, uh, Rafael Morcego. He was in the Bellator Grand Prix in 2013. That's the, the first guy I work with. And uh, he was in a group with um, Gleko Franca, who is fighting now in PFL. That's the, the two fighters, the two first fighters I was working with. And did you have to hang out with them and stuff, or were you just translating for the shows, uh, so to speak? Uh, when uh, fighters come, so sometimes it's part of the promotion. The promotion tell me if I'm available to translate for them. But sometimes it's come from the fighter directly. So the fighters contact me and then we meet in Japan and I translate to the whole thing from the, the days they arrive to the training. I set the training camp, the weight cut, everything to the whole major day until the end of the event. So like they arrive in Japan and I stay and translate for them around a week, 10 days, almost 10 days, which each fighters that I had the pleasure to work with. Yeah. And I think people don't realize like fighters coming to Japan, the weight cut might actually be harder because, you know, finding gyms that have a sauna, for example, most of the gyms don't, you yes. know, like, so it can be pretty difficult. Oh yes, it is because in Japan you not also not only that you not 
allowed to use, you know, most of fighters use sweet sweat, albulin in, uh, to cut their weight. But uh, in Japanese sauna, you're not allowed to wear cream inside the, inside the sauna. So, and uh, use towels, many towels to make, you, to make you sweat. You're not allowed to do that. So it's pretty difficult. So most of them try to cut at the hotel, but uh, inside the hotel, you have to understand that the, the bathtub is super small. You, like if you take a foreigner guy, like um, I had this problem with a guy I was working with. He was too tall for the bathtub. I can't remember his name. He was coming from the from a Vegas, a Vegas fighter. He tried to be inside the, the bathtub, but the bathtub was too small. So he didn't make uh, the weight. Uh, they allow him to fight uh, during the event. Uh, and that was, but in Japan, not making weight is a huge problem because in the US or France, uh, France, we don't have MMA, but um, we have the catch weight for boxing, uh, for kickboxing. We do have catch weight. In Japan, we don't. Uh, catch weight is not, is not allowed in uh, many of promotion. So what they do is they allow you to fight, but you don't get paid. You fight for free, like amateur. You, you fight for free and they take your fight money to reimburse uh, the promotion fees that they engage for you. So you're not allowed to, like you, you can fight, but if you want to get paid, you absolutely have to make weight. So that's a huge problem. And, and were you seeing that a lot with guys because, you know, the cuts are so hard? Yes, I saw that uh, in, uh, in some events with fighters I work with and with other fighters I didn't have the chance to work with. I saw that, I think, like six or seven times around that range. So many fighters, unfortunately, it was fighters from the US and Brazil because, you know, the distance from Brazil to Japan is like 34 hours flight. So when they travel, they save a lot, you know, with the plain food, sodium that come in, that the water holds a lot of sodium, your muscle is tense, you have to take out the oxygen that were in the, in the muscle during the trip. And that's a long, long trip, you get tired, you have the jet lag, that's all make your wake up way more difficult than it should be. So who are some of the most famous fighters that you remember working with? Oh, my favorite, uh, my favorite was when I worked with King Mo in the Rising 2005 Grand Prix. I had the pleasure to work with all the, um, the steps, all his steps to, ca to catch the belt. So I worked with him since his uh, first fight uh, in uh, Rising, but I knew him way before that. I knew him since uh, Sengoku. I didn't have the chance to work with him in Sengoku but I work with him in the Rising, but also other stuff in Japan, like when he came for HDNet to translate K1, I was helping him around. When he wanted to train, I show him gyms. We train together in, uh, in gyms in Japan. And then he contacted me and he said, hey, Zach, I'm fighting in, uh, in Rising. I come to Japan, let's hang out. And then from there, I stay with him for, for all the three rounds until the belt. That's the my favorite moment in the in the in the job. Now, what are some of the gyms that you've trained in in Japan? So now I train myself. I train at Hearts MMA, which uh, has member like Yoshiki Salta. He's the one story champion. Uh, there is uh, Mamoru Uri, which is a former uh, Shuto contender, and uh, we have also uh, Kitaoka. Uh, the Pancras uh, champion, a legend in the in the sports, and uh, we have also uh, Tateo Ino. For those who know Shuto, he was a uh, title title challenger in the last October, and that's the gym I trained mostly uh, over there. Sometimes I used to go crazy B. Uh, the kids Yamamoto gym mm -hmm. and I went also to um, Akiyama, Akiyama Dojo which is gone now uh, which has uh, uh, members like Okami, uh, Akiyama, uh, Aoki 
mostly uh, it was mostly like a competitor's gym. Like, okay, I have a fight. Let's get there in the gym and let's train. It was not like, you know, have classes and uh, when you come, you make your classes, try to get better. It was mostly like, okay, I have a fight coming up. I have to go with partners and then train. That was uh, Akiyama's dojo back then. You know, when the original Killer Bee opened in Shirogane in 2002, yes. the first Killer Bee gym, Yes, you know, I knew Ensign and his brother from when I lived in Hawaii. Yes. So I was close with Ryan Bo. Ryan Bo was the guy who helped me a lot when I lived in Japan. Yes. He was fighting in Shuto. And I, he was one of the fighters that opened the original Killer Bee with Kid Yamamoto. So I spent a lot of time with Kid Yamamoto you know, during that time. Yes. Initially, it was further away from where I live, but, you know, like, I hung out there sometimes and trained right. sometimes. So, yeah, I, I have been around Kid, you know, quite a bit initially, you know. So so you were there when he passed away? You were in yes, Japan? Yes, I went to the, the public funerals. So I had the, the chance to, to pay my respect in the in the public funerals. That was long lines they were a long line many people from all over japan came foreigners foreign media also were there foreign blogs and came to take picture and pay the respect there that was a, a, a big place like you could see very rare uh, kids yamamoto fighting gear like the 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 when he, he knocked out uh, i don't remember his name with the flying knee the guy uh, Mikada. yes you could see the shoes he was wearing at that moment. They were exposed in the in the front walls. You could see all those, uh, how to say, uh, me memorabilia. Uh, and then you have the big picture where kids, uh, kids best fights, and you could pay your respect there. That was pretty cool, pretty cool uh, stuff. Do you remember when you first heard about it? Like, did you had you heard anything that he was? sick or anything did you had you heard anything like that like i was hearing that he had uh, big weight losses that he had big weight loss that he was sick but i didn't know what it was uh, until i heard it uh, on the public news i just knew like like he was not well uh, in uh, in his condition physically and um, but i didn't hear until i saw the news on the on the newspaper and my the guys at my gym told me that uh, he passed away yeah because I, I had a friend in hawaii called me and said you know he kid looks really small now what's wrong with him you know and i was just like ah, who, you know who cares you know like i like thought oh he's retired you know maybe he's not lifting weights you know whatever you know i didn't think anything of it yes yeah, like for me, it came out the blue, like I was, what? No, at first I didn't believe it. I was, no, maybe they won't. Maybe, okay, he's in the hospital, but he's not passed away yet. There's something to be done. But then when I saw the news, I was, damn, I was that, like the, the sky fell on my head. I was, oh, hell no. And then the next day, they announced the funeral, and I said, I got to go, and I, I went to, to, to see yeah, I had Anson on the show and we talked about it quite a bit. And, you know, he said he had a friend in Guam who had called him and said, you know, I saw a kid here. He's really skinny, you know, and Anson was just like me, kind of like blew it off. Like, ah, he's retired. Maybe it's not a big deal. You know, and I also talked to Melkor, who kid went to live with him, you know, before he passed away. Yeah. So maybe I'll send you those shows. But we talked about that a lot, you know, in those two shows. Oh, yes, I had I and I hope to have a chance to see it's cool, you know, to hear about kids and from Anson also from his point of view, because he's been really close to him. That's the guy that launched kids and made him what he is today. So it's pretty cool to see Anson talk about, about kids. Yeah. So let's kind of talk about your stuff. Like maybe we could talk about some of the Japanese fighters you've trained with. Cause a lot of people, just like me, before I went to Japan, I was fans of some of these fighters. Yes. You know, but not many people have a perspective of training with them, you know, so maybe you could talk about some of them like Kitaoka. And I know guys that have trained with them. They say he's incredible grappler and, you know, really strong. So maybe talk about some of these guys that you train with. This is a guy that I've trained with, uh, Yosuke Salta. 
the one FC fighter, the, uh, the ninja is his nickname. I think this guy train with him is crazy because I think he wear his nickname very well. Like when you train with him, he does something to you. You think it is you, for example, you think it's going to be a guillotine, but it's not. He's uh, taking your back. Then when you think he's going to take you back, he's guillotining you. He has some ninja way of thinking that always makes you wondering and wants to learn more. But when you see him outside the training, he's a cool, cool guy, you know, very cool guy, shy, not talking too much, be in his corner, reading his own his book, eating his bento, not saying anything. But when you train with him, you say, oh man, that guy is dangerous. Maybe outside, <laughs> outside the, the training, he's going to kill me. But <laughs> he's a small guy, very, very nice, talk to you, try to to know about about you is interested in the in the foreign fighters he wants to know about foreign fighters a lot to how they train what's the difference between training in japan i had a lot of japanese fighter asking me about that lately like um, um also our our sensei uh, kenji ozawa who fought evan Tanner in the ufc he's our trainer now he's the owner of hearts mma and he's more, I think he's the the most uh, coach in Japan who is interested in the foreign fighters. Many of foreign fighters came to his uh, to his gym to prepare his camp. We had the chance to have Max Holloway in the gym, uh, Uriah Faber, uh, Misha Tate. They all come to when they come to Japan. They come straight to Hearts because he try to get a better English. He's uh, well, way more welcome of uh, foreign fighters to his gym. He travels a lot in Singapore with some of the guys to have a, a foreign camp, try to learn some foreign techniques. I think, yeah, that's uh, what is good uh, about our gym. Maybe talk about some of the other fighters like Kitoka and some of these other guys. Um, so I had trained with uh, also if uh, in other gym I had the chance to um, to see with uh, a training with Kote Tsuboku, a uh, no face. This guy is he has all the you see his look, his stats. You think this guy is is a uh, is a killer. He wants to kill me, but the way he teach you, it takes time. He shows step by step the technique. And he wants you to learn the, the technique properly. Like he's not going to let you alone until you master the technique. That's something I like about him. I didn't have the chance to train a long time with him. But what he showed me, that was amazing. From the way I like his way, where he, the way he teach you the technique, how you get there. Like... When you see him, he just doesn't want you to do the technique. He wants you to do it like him. He wants, like, if he can do it that way, he thinks you can do it that way too. And that's the, the best part about him when I, I train with him. Yeah, I think Boku and some of these guys, they kind of, they got influenced by Kid, you know, because when Boku came to Killer B, because he wasn't there initially, he came like, maybe a month late. or two months after it opened yeah. and he had no tattoos zero you know yeah. so he looked like yeah now <laughs> totally different you know he just so fought think yesterday kid... oh yeah yeah he fought he fought yesterday against uh, a rising star uh, uh salikawa likudo uh, he's a deep fighter so because, you know, uh, Rising in Japan is uh, a fighting promotion that allows, is, a, is not really a promotion, is a platform. As they say themselves, it's a platform who takes the best fighters from different promotion. But their concept is like, you have a legend and you have a rising stars. So you have a legend like kind of the end of the career, but still a, a good challenge. And you have rising stars uh, that try to make their name. So rising uh, promote those fights. That's the fights they want to make. And Kotetsu lately fought twice in uh, one month. So he fought yesterday. 
he did a great fight for three rounds, but at the end of the third round, he got knocked out. But um, we see a different Boku that we used to see. Normally, he's more like, you know, grappling and stuff. But yesterday, we saw him doing body shots, head movements, try to take downs. He was a different fight. Are you there? 